Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 27 of the simple series of my Z80 assembly programming tutorials. This is part two of the enterprise sprite clipping example. We've got this um, fine sprite clipping example where our sprite can go partially off the screen, controlled by my joypad here. Um, what we're going to look at this time, though, is some of the tricks I'm using to make this a bit more um, quick and a bit more of a professional, if you will, uh, drawing routine. Now, what we're doing is two things. Firstly, we're using double buffering. This means there's two screen buffers, each of which is about 12K. It's a 16 K bank but we're only using 12k of it and basically we're drawing one while the other is being shown and then we're swapping them over and so this means that the user never sees the screen redrawing hopefully and so they don't see any kind of flicker it doesn't mean we're wasting a bit of memory but on the 128k systems it's probably worth it. The other thing we're using is known as uh, stack misuse or stack abuse and this is where we use the stack pointer in a way that isn't really intended. We can basically push data to fill an area or we can pop data to read data very quickly and that's what we're doing here. We're pushing data to clear the screen and popping it to, as part of our sprite routines. Now the only thing I would say is I'm actually using stack misuse as part of the clipping routines but because the um, pop command works in byte pairs this means that every other movement we are having to miss a line because we are, we would need to read in an odd number of bytes and the stack misuse can't do that. What I would actually suggest is you have two versions of the sprite drawing routine, a cropping one which doesn't use stack misuse and a regular one for when the sprite is entirely on the screen which does but today's example does use it for both. So we're going to be looking at all of these tricks in today's code which we will go and have a look at right now. Okay, so here is the code for today's example. First of all, let's have a look at this page flipping and let's see how that is being done. Now the start of the page flipping um, is actually the initialization routine. Now I haven't covered the initialization routine because it's based on the simple series one and it's quite long. The important thing to notice though is we are running this bank switch request video bank this requests a 16 kilobyte block of memory within the first 64 kilobytes. Now the Enterprise 128, like the Enterprise 64, had a base 64K, which was sort of the um, the, the original built-in memory, and then it had extended memory on top of that. But that extended memory cannot be used for the video memory. It can only be in the base 64K. So we need to request two video banks that can be used for video memory, and this is being done by this routine here. Now we're storing those two in buffer two and buffer one and these variables do not change from that point. So we've now got these two banks and the other thing that's important to notice is that the memory address that these banks are referred to to the um, hardware, the video hardware, is the actual address within that 64K base. But because of the advanced page uh, bank switching within the enterprise itself, the Z80 could see those banks anywhere. And when we draw to the screen, we're always going to draw to the C000 and onwards range, and we will page in whichever bank we need to the Z80 so that it always writes to the C000 range and that range will now be the bank that's being drawn. However, the um, video hardware will need that referring to in the way that it actually is mapped in the first 64K of memory. So, but don't be surprised that, you, that there is two ways of specifying that memory bank to the system. So a bit tricky, I know, but unfortunately, when you get into complex concepts like page flipping, it does become tricky. And if it's too hard for you, use XOR sprites and come up with a simpler game. Dizzy and um, the Island of Doctor Structo are two fantastic games. They used XOR. So if this is too hard for you, just use XOR and don't use any page flipping. But um, anyway, we're going to look at how we can do it. So buffer one and two never change. And those are the initialized memory banks. Active buffer is going to flip between 0 and 1 and this is used to select which one of the two is being shown and which one of the two is being written to and we're going to flip those over every other frame like that and that's how we do things. So we've got this page flip routine here. We're loading B and C with buffer 1 and 2. We are then XORing the active buffer each time and every other time we are going to swap B and C over. So B and C are going to be our two banks. And then what we're going to do is we are going to do two things. Firstly, we need to page in the bank for the actual Z80 to write the bitmap data during the next execution of the sprite routines. As I say, always going to be at C000, whichever bank is actually being drawn to. But we also need to transfer this to the video hardware. Now, the video hardware uses a line parameter table, the LPT, and this is defined as part of our initialization routine. And this is actually in one of the bank, the buffers themselves. The buffer one 
it is actually at the FF00 range here. That's where that data is being stored. So we need to first page in buffer one and we need to change the line parameter table and update the VRAM address of the visible screen, which could be in the other buffer and then half the time it will be. So we need to set DE to the correct value for that. So what we're doing here is we're taking our buffers and we are taking our buffer bit that is in B and that will be flipped every other time and we are shifting it to the right twice and this is basically moving two of the bits from B into the top part of the DE pair. Now as I say the, the C000 range is what the, C, the Z80 sees but what the video hardware sees will be a different bank number and so that's why we're doing this and that's why we're patching that back in to this line parameter table and we're patching it in at the video address one part and we're just calculating the correct address for that in the line parameter table that is now at FF00 within buffer one. So that has now set up the line parameter table for the visible screen. What we need to do next though is page in the correct bank that we actually want to write to at the C000 range. So here we were always paging in buffer one to update that line parameter table. Here we are writing the buffer that we actually want to write to from C. We're outing that to B3. And this is selecting which bank is seen by the Z80 at that range. So we're doing that there. Then all we're doing here is we are clearing any interrupts and we are waiting for an interrupt here. And the reason we're doing this is we're waiting for the next full V blank so that we don't start drawing to VRAM while the old buffer is still being shown to the screen because you would get some flickering down the bottom. If you're really desperate for time, you wouldn't want to do this, but if your program is very fast or very simple like this one is, you do really want to wait for a V blank to make sure you don't see any flickering at the bottom. And TB Ackerman didn't wait because it was desperate for time and sometimes you would see a very slight flicker at the bottom of the screen. So there's something to bear in mind there. Okay, so that's how we're doing the page flipping. Let's have a look at this stack misuse. Now, as I say, stack misuse is involved using the stack pointer in ways other than the way it should be used. As a basic rule, this means that you can't do any calls and you can't have any interrupts because an interrupt is effectively a call because remember a call will push the return address onto the stack. And if you're using the stack for other things, that might not work so well. If you're very clever, you can. You can still use interrupts and also calls if you know what you're doing. And I've got a tutorial in the multi-platform series on an advanced interrupt handler, which does cope with that kind of thing. But for today, we're going to work with the simple rule of you can't use interrupts or calls. So at the start of our clear screen routine, we're going to disable interrupts and we're going to basically back up the stack pointer into IY. Now we can't transfer it directly, but we can add the stack pointer to IY and we set IY to zero at the start, which basically transfers the stack pointer to IY. We're then loading the stack pointer with the register HL. Well, why are we doing that? Well, our clear screen routine here is specifying the end of the range we want to clear. Now, our screen is 256 by 192, and this is effectively 12 kilobytes. And it's always at the screen base C000 onwards, and it will end at F000. And so we're specifying the end of the range it, we're specifying D is the bytes we want to fill, FF is white, and then we're going to repeatedly push, and this is going to effectively fill the entire range. And we've got a, a large sequence of push commands, and we need to do 192 in total to fill the full 12K range, because each, we're using 32 push commands, and that's 64 bytes, because each does two. So that's what we've got here, a big sequence of pushes, and then we've got a DJNZ at the end. Now, why are we doing so many pushes and so few loops? Well, this is referred to as unwrapping the loop. Now, you see, doing a DJNZ or any kind of de decrement or and compare command is a bit slow. It wastes some CPU power. So by having lots and lots of commands and very few loops, we can reduce the amount of processing power that's wasted by DJNZ. And this is what ten it tends to come to when you're trying to optimize. You've got two choices. You can either sacrifice memory and gain speed or sacrifice speed and gain memory. You usually can't do both. And that's the, the choice we've made here is for speed at the waste of all of these commands. That's what we've done. Now, at the end of our loop, we are we finished, so we are moving the IY back to the stack pointer, and this is now got a correct stack point, and we can now return. We might want to enable interrupts at this point, but f for this example, I've left them disabled because uh, I leave it to the calling routine to decide whether interrupts should come back on, because maybe the next routine needs to do something weird with them as well. So I, I tend to leave them disabled at the end of a routine and leave it to the next calling routine for simplicity and safety. It reduces the number of bugs that happen because if you turn on interrupts on at the wrong time, you might get some kind of crash or you might get bad bad data from 
from hardware if you're doing outs that the interrupt would affect. So leaving them disabled there. Now, the other place that I am using stack misuse is the show sprite routine. Now, instead of writing, I'm actually using it as a reading source. So we're going to read data by popping it off the stack. So we're setting the stack pointer to the start of the bitmap data and we're popping the data off in pairs. Now, unfortunately, we're using an XOR routine here, which makes this a little bit inefficient and possibly not worth doing, but it's just an example. Anyway, we've now got the stack pointer pointing to our bitmap data. So again, we can't do any calls at this point or any real pushes and pops for backing up data. We're then popping a pair of bytes, and this is now two bytes of our bitmap data, and we're XORing them with the screen. And as I say, this is a shame, because if we weren't XORing, we could make this quite efficient by putting E here and by putting D here. And that would be a no very nice, efficient way of getting that bitmap data back to the screen. But we can't do that with XOR, so we're probably losing most of the efficiency there. But as I say, this is just an example. So after each pair of bytes, we're doing the next. And we were just repeating here. And because we're doing a pair here, this is why when we get to the end of the screen, we start to see that every other movement, we're getting a line being missed and because we're working in pairs of bytes at all times. And as I say, probably better to have two versions of this routine, one that uses stack misuse for entirely on the screen and one that doesn't when we're partially clipped. That's what I would suggest. Anyway, what we're doing here, once we've done a line, is we're jumping to the get next line routine. Why are we jumping rather than calling? because we can't use calls because that's, that would cause some data be, to be pushed onto the stack. And the stack is actually our bitmap data. We would corrupt our sprites if we did that. So we're jumping, we're using self-modifying code if we need to clip. Now the get next line routine is adding 64 and we're jumping back to get next line return to avoid using a call. And that's just jumping back here. If the sprite is partially clipped, we're using self-modifying code and we're changing get next line to get next line with clip. And you can see here, we are basically setting HL via self-modifying code to the bytes to skip after each line. And we're adding that to the stack pointer and we're updating the stack pointer here. And then we are returning. So basically this is allowing us to skip any bytes, keeping that stack pointer up to date. But as I say, I have a distinct suspicion that all of this isn't really worth it for this example. Firstly, the XOR is wasting some efficiency and all, uh, with, with regards to how well the stack point to, uh, stack misuse will work. And also, as I say, partially off screen sprites, probably easier just to use a simple one unless you have some kind of game that is almost entirely partially off screen sprites or something, which is not going to be mostly the case. So Chibi Akam is the, you know, you would have sprites at the edges of the screen occasionally, the vast majority of the time they're in the center of the screen. And I had a variety of optimized routines um, for the on-screen sprites. There was one that could do transparency. There was one that could do certain widths without transparency that was much faster. Um, by having fixed width sprites, uh, as I say, there were ver different versions of the sprite code for you know, a 32 pixel wide, 64 pixel wide, 128 pixel wide. And again, and this was unwrapping the loop, so I didn't have to have an X loop counter. I just had a sequence of LDI commands. So again, there's a lot of options there for you. And I would suggest, again, if you've got the memory, multiple versions of your sprite routine gains you speed at the cost of memory. And that's often what you want to do on a Z80 system. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed what you've seen to go. Go to the website and download the source code and use it in any way you can. Thanks for watching and goodbye.